Daniel Eskridge, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from your home in Atlanta. Now, you're a senior software engineer with a degree in computer science, but you are also an artist who uses computers to create highly detailed paintings of everything from landscapes to dragons and, of course, paleo art, which is what we're going to be talking mostly about today. Uh, but before we get into the world of mammoths and smilodons, let's just hear a little bit about your background. When you were growing up in the metro Atlantic area, was drawing and painting something that uh, you were always doing? Uh, to some degree, yeah. I actually uh, was a big fan of sci-fi fantasy novels, uh, the, the Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons thing as a kid. Um, so I always just kind of copy the art. I also had tons of comic books, uh, all that kind of such. However, yeah. I didn't really get into art heavily until I was in high school. And just by chance, I had an open slot in one semester where I had to take something. So I decided to take art. And it turned out I was taking it from this guy who was sort of a local legend. He was a former roadie for the band Molly Hatchet. He was a, had done all this stuff. But he was, turned out to be a fantastic art teacher. So he really got me involved in, wow. in doing this so much so that the very next year I went to college, I majored in art as well as computer science. Well, Daniel, you're known for your 3D render computer art. So what is it about making art in this way that you prefer over traditional painter's materials? Do you occasionally paint the um, the old-fashioned way? Um, yeah, actually, I I do have one uh, old-fashioned painting, I guess, down here. You can't really see it probably for the darkness, but that's um, I believe it's an acrylic painting. But yeah, I actually prefer traditional materials. But hmm. the problem is they are messy slow and there's a lot of dangerous chemicals involved so i kind of got them out of the house when my oldest child was born however uh when it comes to 3d rendering i've also been doing that for a very long time i grew up in a house with lots of computers in it my dad worked for ibm so we had computers when most people didn't know what a pc even was and i started with right. uh one day i just happened to find programs called ray trace programs where you actually code a picture so you describe hmm. it in you know place a sphere at such and such point it looks like c you know c sharp code or c plus plus code and you compile this code but instead of piling compiling to a program it would compile to a picture uh, nowadays it's a lot easier we have the um the front ends where i can design a picture more visually which is a lot more fun but uh i've always kind of liked hmm. uh, the ability to do stuff on the computer. One of the things I like about 3D rendering is I can kind of set a scene up and let it go. And you know, 24 hours later, sometimes a week later, when the thing is done, I'm kind of surprised by the results. So it's not there. There's some, some uh, anticipation that I kind of enjoy with it. Now, your paleo art is just amazing. And you've painted so many popular prehistoric creatures, mammoths, uh, saber tooth, dire wolves. It's not a subject that every artist chooses to paint. So I can only assume that uh, you are a fan of all things prehistoric. Um, yeah, well, I'm a fan of all things art, but prehistoric yeah. art, particularly <laughs> dinosaurs, is mm. was really popular from the start with three D three D rendering. I don't know how it got that way, but it's one of those things that if you started as a three D artist, you kind of touched on dinosaurs, and and it's just one of those things. I also like to do for any kind of artwork. I like to do lots of research, and it's it's a fun topic to research. There's no shortage of information online for uh, paleontology stuff. Unlike um, other subjects I do like Western here, where it's a lot harder to find stuff online. I mean, oh, you, yeah. you think there'd be a lot on the old West, but there really isn't. But anyway, so when it, yeah, it comes to paleontology, um, there's a good number of resources, uh, like I said, online. Um, we also have you know, being Atlanta, we have a good science museum that I can go down. Uh, we're members oh, yeah. of, we're down there regularly. So, uh, yeah, and I do like all things prehistoric. And lately, I've been trying to work more towards prehistoric mammals. But uh, yeah, it's my favorite. I, mean, <laughs> I think that's how I found you out there when it comes to like Eocene mammals and, and hmm. such. But uh, the one area where dinosaurs trouble me is environments. It's a lot more mm. difficult to find what environment should look like for the Cretaceous period or the Jurassic period. I mean, you can find some information, but it's it's a lot more sparse. When it comes to prehistoric mammals, though, I can just use modern plants and uh, you know foliage and uh, ground cover, especially. So that that, that does make uh, prehistoric mammals a bit easier. 
whereas there's you know less yeah. information you're going to find on uh, you know, Andrew Sarkis or something like that online. Yeah, the environment would take ages to paint, I would imagine. Um, it's a little bit easier with uh, the 3D tools I use, but I do have to sometimes sculpt some new plants to, mm. uh, you know, because not a lot of them and sometimes take liberties because there's not a great amount of information on them. Daniel, let's concentrate now on the process of creating a piece and let's stick to paleo art. What is the process for you? How do you research an animal that has been extinct for thousands, if not millions of years? <laughs> well, Google is usually a pretty good start. However, oh, yeah. <laughs> all of my ideas come from visiting uh, the local science museums. Uh, we have a couple actually here in Atlanta that are very nice. We have the, uh, the Fernbank Museum of Natural History as well mm -hmm. as a newer one called TELUS which is oh, right. um, a little bit less paleontology, but it just still does have a museum there. So usually I'll go there and there's traveling shows that come in and out every three months and I'll be inspired by something I see there and read all the information on it there. And then I'll yeah, get online and um, you know, you can usually start with just the basics, the Wikipedia page, uh, mm -hmm. and then you start getting more into the paleontology specific sites occasionally if I'm not getting a great amount of information or if I'm researching something that's really, you know, kind of recent, I might wind up shooting off a few emails if I can find some, you know, somebody, if I can mine an email address from a web page somewhere or something like that, I'll send them an email and ask for some details. Uh, almost everybody's willing to provide information. So how long does it take you generally to complete a project? And after that, uh, how does it get out into the world for people to see and enjoy? Generally, the first time I do a new creature, it takes it can take anywhere from two weeks to two months if I have to sculpt it from scratch or if I'm borrowing parts from another one. But once I've finished a sculpture of a creature, I can usually crank out a few about about an image a week, I, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it depends on the environment because being a 3D simulation on a computer, if there's lots of fog and clouds, it can really slow it down and sometimes take as much as a month to generate an image. Uh, when it comes to actually getting something out there, um, I usually have a pretty specific process, a set of websites I go to, uh, DeviantArt, Fine Art of America. But yeah, I have like a, a specific process. I have like a checklist. I have to go down and say, okay, I have a mm. to this site, to this site, to this site, published to my Facebook. Now, a lot of my work will sit for about a year before it gets published, um, just because I don't really? want to publish too. I've discovered that if I publish too much at one time, a lot of it gets skipped over. So mm. I try to stick to two works per week. Now, like I said, it sometimes takes a couple of weeks for me to finish the work, but I'm also working on usually around 10 works at a time. I mean, some of them take you know, a lot longer because I only work on them in a few minutes a day. Sometimes I get really interested in, you know, just... Of uh, different genres? Like you do a Western and then you move over to a dinosaur and then to yeah. a dragon and... Wow. Yeah, how I, do you... I, I, I alternate through genres quite a lot. I usually try to do at least one paleo art per week, at least one published per week. But there's, as I said, once I have a model done for one, I'll crank out a bunch of images. So they start, the pipelines kind of builds up and I, I'm probably a, a good deal behind on it at the moment. So I think right now I'm working on a, a series of uh, Majungasauruses that are uh, going out oh. there. I remember one of them, that's actually one I, actually kind of like quite a bit but yeah so there, there will be a lot of stuff backed up now the western is probably the next most behind paleo art i try to get a western piece out about every about mm. two, per, two two maybe three per month 
those are like my big sellers for prints, whereas the paleo work is my big seller for licensing. So um, those are those being my two biggest ones now. Also, I have the most fun with fantasy, but it's it not received. You know, it, it, there's so much competition in the world out there and I've done it for so long. Sometimes I do get tired of it. So fantasy works one or two uh, every couple of months. Um, there's just a few other miscellaneous genres in there. Just if the mood takes me, I'll create one of those. For finishing work, it generally takes me mm -hmm. a week to two weeks. Um, it depends a lot on uh, if it's a new model that I'm working on, that's going to take a lot longer to sculpt it. I might borrow parts from another model or whatnot. But uh, once I have a model, I can usually crank them out pretty quickly. Uh, around a week you know, for an image, sometimes less. It depends a lot on the environment that I'm going to be rendering. There's, uh, you know, if there's a lot of clouds and fog, sometimes just the algorithms that generate the image run really slow. And occasionally I get mm. the one that takes like a month to render. I hope those don't happen too often. Um, and do you find that once it's rendered, you're completely happy with it? Or do you say, do you say, oh, I have to do it. I want to do that bit again and render it for another month. <laughs> that, well, no, that rarely no. happens. Um, what usually what happens <laughs> is if there's problems with it, which there always is, no render comes out totally satisfactory. Um, I usually spend another several days uh, in, um, I use GIMP mostly, sometimes yeah. Photoshop, but uh, mostly GIMP. I'll just do a lot of hand painting. So I get back to my, the skills that I picked up in college for you know, painting in oils and acrylics, they come in more handy there. But yeah, there's uh, generally quite a bit of uh, post-production involved with any render. Do you find that um, it's similar to waiting for oil paint to dry? <laughs> well, <laughs> it doesn't take a month, but it almost takes a month, I seem to remember, from my well, art well, college somebody, days. Yeah, um, it's a little bit like that, but I guess I might have said earlier, there's sort of the anticipation of seeing how it's going to turn out. I mean, I can yeah. kind of see how it looks, but generally at the resolutions that I'm rendering at, it shows me a small, really terrible um, version of it with you know, it's highly pixelated. And uh, for some reason, it just the, uh, the rendering engine I use just doesn't compress the image very well while it's rendering it. Once it comes out in the end, it looks fine. But so I have some idea, but it does, you know, as I said, it's a bit of a surprise every time. Daniel, uh, your work is so professional. You're so prolific. Uh, we see your art in all kinds of online platforms such as Zazzle and Fine Art America, as you've said. And what about film and television? I can well imagine your images of prehistoric creatures making their way onto uh, documentaries. Um, I've had a few people email me and say, hey, look, I spotted your image here. What happens a hmm. lot with my paleo art is I put it on um, sites that allow it to be licensed out. And I don't always know who licenses them, but it, uh, I usually sell around uh, 10 to 12 licenses every day. Wow. So I imagine most of those go to um, somebody's uh, slideshow for some corporation or something like that. A lot of them wind up in, wind up in uh, newspapers. That, you know, occasionally I have one that suddenly I get a flood of emails saying, I saw this in, the news, in your newspaper. Like I had about a year ago, there was a possible sighting of a Yeti. And I had a picture of a Yeti that wound up in every major newspaper, but I don't know necessarily what's going to happen. So sometimes I'm surprised and I do see my stuff on, uh, on documentaries and stuff. And now I only have um, Netflix here. So documentaries, I have to kind of have to go out of my way to watch, but uh, cause they're kind of mediocre sometimes on Netflix. But uh, yeah, I'll sometimes say, Hey, there's one of mine. Yeah. <laughs> we're watching it. Do your uh, kids ever notice anything on TV? So that's dad's. Yeah, so uh, they they don't notice it as much, so I have to point it out to them. But my wife will notice occasionally. <laughs> so, has your work been displayed physically in uh, exhibitions and museums? I'm assuming they they have been. Yeah, in fact, what uh, getting on what I was talking about before, being surprised. So we went down to uh, Fernbank to see the traveling show on pterosaurs. And at the end of the show, here's one of my works. You know, it had been turned into a giant wall sticker. It was all the way on the wall. Um, I'll have to find that for you and send it to you. But, uh, you know, my, of course, you know, I'm, I had to stand in front of it and my family is taking pictures of me and all this, but I had no idea it was there. And it's probably, as I said, it's a traveling show, so it probably goes from museum to museum. But I also get calls from occasionally, um, like the zoos will sometimes want to post some of my stuff because I have a lot hmm. of wildlife art as well. But sometimes they might be referencing paleo art too, just as, you know, sometimes zoos do that, I guess. So uh, 
yeah, it, it's uh, displayed all over the place um, now for actual sort of high-end galleries and stuff. I have a few um, Western pictures that people have, uh, some gallery owners have requested, uh, but there's not a huge amount of, of demand for that these days. Um, right. Here in the, around me, it's mostly modern art that the galleries want to stock. Well, I think paleo art is coming into its own. Um, I know that uh, my, my Instagram and several others like it. People just love it. They just love it. It's more successful um, online. I mean, you certainly there's, uh, if you if you want to actually get comments, you know, on a picture, you know, go post. Uh, it's paleo art on. Uh, there's a site called Vegan Art. You'll get mm. you'll you'll learn a lot because um, there you're going to have a lot of people who will correct every possible mistake you made. Oh yes, how could you possibly say that dinosaur was striped? You know, yeah, striped. <laughs> kind uh, of thing. You know, it should have feathers here, but not here. Uh, I've got but, muscular, you know, the muscles need to be tweaked here or the, the, the way the leg connects is not, you know, you get everything. But you can only, well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with artistic license. And second of all, the science might change the week after anyway. So, right. Well, now sometimes I'll post on here a, uh, uh, when I put up a piece of paleo art, that's maybe a little bit more artistic. I'll put a, a disclaimer on there saying my primary focus is art and paleontology is, I tried to do my best, but, you know, if I want to make the dinosaur look, you know, more active in some way, you know, I might stretch its legs or, you know, pose it in some way. I get it a lot, actually, with uh, almost as bad as paleo art is equestrian art. So if you mm. pose the horse's legs wrong, a lot of people will come and tell you that you pose those horse's legs wrong. Oh. What do people like, in terms of paleo art, what, what do they... What do they enjoy looking at the most? Would it be a mammoth or the dodo? Or I know you've done a thylacine as well, which I've didn't, recently done an interview about. <laughs> I wish more people would look at the thylacine. They really like that work. The one that, I, that gets by far the most traffic are mammoths for me. I, yeah, they're very say, popular. If I were to go to um, you know check out my stats on what's been downloaded and viewed, there's a excuse me a specific picture of three mammoths. Uh, I think I called it Lords of the Ice Age or something like that. It's uh, that one is is enormously popular, and I, I find that one now in books occasionally when I go to like the uh, you know the, the the dinosaur section in the bookstore or in the library or something like that. Okay, that was fantastic. It's been great to get an insight into your work. But before we go, uh, is there a project that you're working on at the moment that uh, that perhaps you can talk about and let us in on? Well, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm doing a series on uh, Majungasaurus, and I'll, I'll probably, I think I've already published the one that I thought was the best, but there, there'll probably be a, a dozen others that um, I just make available on the um, licensing circuit. So uh, I have my cat running around here. Um, Working on that for paleontology. Uh, also, I'm planning on doing um, a lot of aquatic, prehistoric aquatic animals. There's, I'm Ooh. finding that uh, I'm getting requests for those a lot, actually, of uh, you know, various um, prehistoric or uh, aquatic reptiles. I, I, I'm guessing probably the Mosasaur, since he appeared in the Jurassic World. Not so no. much, common, actually. Um, <laughs> really? Uh, plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. So uh, I uh, they'll end up on out. Loch Ness monster sites, I think. Yeah, probably, no, if you're not careful, I actually was planning on doing a Loch Ness monster scene. Um, but oh, I, that would... I haven't gotten that started yet. There, there's, I have uh, a, um, I use a, whenever I have an idea, I have a uh, website that I go to called Evernote, and I just jot it. Down. Oh yes, and that's yeah you know, for some time in the future. And I think I have probably 300 things in my to do list there of things I want to do. Well, yeah, it's such a success with that Yeti picture, Dan. I think that maybe doing a uh, a series on the Loch Ness would just go through the roof. Yeah, it might be fun. Um, I do have yeah. one. I think some that are I've, I've called Sea Monster, and it's just you know I took a plesiosaur model and put it up there, but they get some traffic. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's something that's specifically Loch Ness. Yes, you, know, you know, planning on doing like you know a person in a rowboat seeing it or something like that. Should oh be yeah. Fun. Yeah, um, yeah, I've had a few successes with the um, the the crypto zoology stuff. It's uh, another one of those subjects that you, you can, it tends to attract some rather strange 
contacts. People will email me stuff with some uh, weird requests. Yeah, uh, people say, I've seen one, and uh, yeah, let me describe that. it for you. <laughs> yeah, which is sometimes fun, but, you know, sometimes there you're you like, you come out and look at it with me? It's like, uh, I don't know if I want to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I will leave links to your social media and various websites below uh, so people can see your work and order prints. Daniel Eskridge, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, too.